This is the Cold Steel SRK, or Survival Rescue Knife, a knife that has been around for quite some time, reviewed by a great number of people. But one question remains, at least for me, is this knife a good bushcraft knife? If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on that, Keep watching. So just before we get started, I want to thank my friend Derek Croft for loaning me this knife so that I could test it out and get my thoughts on it in relation to using it for bushcraft. So it was not a gift. It was not sent to me by the company, but I do not own it. But I will tell you, it was brand new when I received it. So Derek, I hope you don't mind when you get it back that it has been marked up because it has been used heavily over the last what, almost a year since you sent it to me? Okay, so what I thought I would do is first talk about this knife in terms of its intended design, who it was for when it was first built. I'll give you the specifications for it, but then we're going to do some testing and using it in a bushcraft style of way, and then we'll pass my thoughts on it. All right, I want to start by reading what Cold Steel has to say about this knife on their website because I think it's very relevant to the discussion we're going to have. So, the Cold Steel SRK or Survival Rescue Knife was designed specifically with this in mind. A popular knife with military and tactical law enforcement personnel, the SRK is the standard issue of the Navy SEALs for their BUDS or Basic Underwater Demolition training. The SRK has proved it's worth time and time again in the most demanding environments. Whatever the mission, we're confident that the SRK knife is for you. Okay, so, um, wow, that's quite a statement there. Uh, Let's just pull that part a little bit and talk about this as a survival rescue knife. I think there's a few, few things that are worth knowing. First off, this is not the original design. I recall when the SRK first came out from Cold Steel, I don't know how many years ago it is now, it looked similar but not the same. The blade was definitely heavier. It was not coated in this black coating. It had carbon V, I believe was the steel that it was uh, being used at that time. And it was in a saber grind. It looked, again, it looked similar. It had a lot of the same features that this stuff, knife does, but it was different. And at that time, I recall, it wasn't called the survival, re survival rescue knife originally, if I am not wrong, it was called the search and rescue knife. Okay, semantics. It was still a knife intended for survival, rescue, whatever. And according to Cold Steel, it is used by law enforcement and military units and including the Navy uh, SEALs in their BUD training. That's quite a testament to the strength of this knife. Uh, okay, that leaves us with the belief and understanding that this is a survival knife. And I just want to talk about what a survival knife really is. And then we'll talk about whether or not we can compare a survival knife with, and call it, a bushcraft knife. So I think what is important first is that I go over the specifications. Now, I'll do this briefly because, of course, it will all be in the video description under this uh, title and uh, overall length. I think I can give you this while or read this while I'm showing it to you. Overall length of this knife is 10 and 3 quarters inches or 273 millimeters. Blade thickness and it is quite stocky, quite thick, is 5 millimeters. Blade length comes in at an even 6 inches or 152.6 millimeters. The handle length is 4 and 3 quarters or 120.6 millimeters. The weight of the knife, and this is without the sheath of course, is 8.2 ounces or 232.5 grams. The steel in this knife is SK5 steel and it has what Cold Steel refers to as a Black Tough X finish some type of a durable black coating. Okay, durable is relative. It depends on how much you use the knife, of course. The handle material is what cold steel refer to as Crayx or, or Craton. It's a hard, firm, rubberized material that provides plenty of grip. There's no question about that. And the sheath. The sheath is not Kydex. It is a Kydex looking material. They refer to it as Securex. It's a type of injection molded 
uh, fiberglass. So, you know, it's functional, not Kydex, but does everything, I think, or at least most of what Kydex will do for you. It has a nylon belt loop. Let me lay the knife down for a second. The uh, knife is fairly secure. I'll show you that in a second, but it does have an extra security uh, snap on, dome snap on the, uh, that wraps around the handle. The sheath can be taken on or off your belt without taking your, or undoing your belt, because it has a Velcro and a dome snap security here or you can just use it by passing your belt through and it is quite large so you can get it on pretty much the largest of all your belts that you're likely to wear. It is adjustable through Phillips screws that you can run it up and down the handle. I suppose you could turn this sideways and uh, wear it scout, but I don't think that that belt loop would allow for that. But you know I guess what it does and especially with those uh, oval openings. It allows you to mount it on backpacks or any uh, combat harness that you're wearing. So it gives you a number of uh, options for mounting this knife. And I said I would show it to you in its sheath. Now, here's the thing that uh, I'll pass my I guess my thoughts on it as I go along. There is nothing satisfying about sliding this into the sheath. Now, what I mean by that is a well-designed Kydex sheath. Uh, and even leather for that matter, if it's well done, the knife will seem to snap into place. I don't get that with this knife, and it is not the fault of the Securex. Well, I guess it does a little bit snappy, but it just feels uh, rubbery, and, and that's because of the handle. It is secure, there's no question about it. I kind of pushed it in fairly hard, but there, it does go in. You do get the confidence that it is insecure. It just doesn't give me quite the same satisfaction the snap does in a Kydex sheath with a micarta or even a wood handle. There is no question this is not coming out of its sheath with no matter what your activity. I think even if you are a paratrooper, there's a good, no, I don't know. I have no experience in that. Uh, I, I think there's a good chance this is going to remain in your sheath. You want to wear it um, upside down on your belt or on, on your equipment, then it's likely still to do so. The, it's the added security of the dome snap does give you a little bit more peace of mind. I'll tell you where that gives me peace of mind is moving through the woods because the knife does want to do this on my belt, which is a pro and a con. It makes it a little easier to sit down, but it uh, just gives me, kind of gets in the way at times. So when I'm moving through the woods and I want to feel really confident that this is not going to get yanked out of its sheath by anything or followed if I were to fall over, then of course, why not just snap it up? I did put a small piece of paracord loop on the end of it. This serves two purposes. It is orange because, well, the knife is black and uh, things happen, right? You can drop it on the ground or you can drop it in the snow and it helps to find it again. But I've left a, enough of a loop, just a tiny loop. I'm not a big fan of this otherwise, but enough of a loop that I can get my baby finger inside and then I can move back on the handle and use it for chopping. Okay, let's be clear. This is not a chopping knife. I have some big knives intended and built for chopping. This is not something I would spend a lot of my energy on using to chop with. However, I can see and have done little snap cuts, clearing little uh, small limbs off of a larger branch. It works quite well for that. So yeah, it'll work for light, light chopping work, but don't plan on taking down any big pieces of timber with it, at least by not by using the weight of the knife and, and uh, hacking at the tree with it. Easy enough though, you could take a good sized tree down or branch off by using this and a baton to beaver chew around the stock. And yeah, that's a perfectly legitimate way of using this knife. Okay, let's just talk about its intended purpose, a survival knife. Yes, military, police application maybe. Uh, as you know, as a police officer, I can't see unless I was a special unit designed for going off grid, uh, no, I don't think too many police officers are carrying this on their duty belt, at least in urban settings, unless they are, happen to be a tactical unit. But as a military knife, or for you as a non-military person, and you're looking at this in terms of it as a survival knife, let's just talk about that for a second. So what is a survival knife? These are my thoughts on it. Your thoughts may differ. You're welcome to have your opinion differing from mine. You're welcome to express your opinion differing from mine. I mean, that's what's great about this, right? 
Here's my thoughts on a survival knife. A survival knife is the knife you have on you when you find yourself in a survival situation. It could be your pocket knife. It could be your multi-tool. It could be your Swiss Army knife. That's your survival knife. Now, uh, will they do the same work as this? Absolutely not. But neither will this do the work of an ax or a saw. So it's what do you want to have in your hands if you were to find yourself in a survival situation? If I am counting on a knife to bring me through a survival situation and I'm likely to pack that knife with me, then um, it's not going to be this one. It's going to be something much, much bigger, something I can count on to do all the heavy work that I may have to do, such as shelter building or wood processing in a survival situation. However, if I've given the forethought to take that big knife with me, then I hopefully have given the forethought to including all the other things that I would likely need as well, including maybe an ax and a saw. Yeah, I know, it could be just a day trip, it could be a hunting trip or fishing trips. You wanna take a good sized tool with you just in case, but you don't wanna to have to take all the tools that, you, that would be nice to have in a survival situation. In fact, if you are that prepared, likely, unless you're injured, and are somewhat at, somewhat at risk of dying, you're not truly in a survival situation, you're in an unplanned camping situation, at least that's the attitude I have towards it. If I were to get turned around in the woods or lost or, and, or whatever happened, held by a storm, and I needed to stay there for an extended period of time, overnight, one or two days, unless I'm at risk of dying. That's not a survival situation. Survival is about staying alive, right? Okay, I know that was a bit of a rant about survival. There was a reason for that. That's not what a bushcraft knife is all about. A bushcraft knife is designed and intended for use when you plan on going to the woods. You are actively looking to go out and use your skills in the woods. You are prepared for the trip to the woods. May have a shelter. If not, you have shelter building materials or you have the ability to build a shelter when you're out there. Whether it's a day or an overnight trip or even an extended trip. A bushcraft knife often, and this is probably the generally accepted definition for it, is a knife that's used primarily for use with wood in tasks such as, yes, fire preparation, tent stake making, Figure four traps if you want to build those for cap, uh, getting some food. Uh, those types of things, crafts around the camp. That's what a bushcraft knife primarily is for. And for that reason, the knife tends to be smaller, not six inches in length, rarely more than four inches in length because that is what a usable length knife is for those type of tasks. Can you do bushcraft with a larger knife? Oh, absolutely, of course you can. And this knife will do bushcraft tasks. But end, end of the story here is that not as well as a dedicated or purpose-designed bushcraft knife. This will still do it, as we'll demonstrate in a few moments' time. But it's still just not the knife that I would choose to take out if I knew that I was going to be doing bushcraft. Um, Okay, so I've talked about what a survival knife is. I've talked about what a bushcraft knife is, at least in my opinions. Let's just see how well this knife performs doing bushcraft tasks. All right, staying with the theme that this is a bushcraft task, I have cut two pieces of wood using my saw. And this is a piece of rock maple and it well dead, of course. The bark was kind of coming off of it, so it was a little suspect about just how good the quality of the wood is, but it is dead hard and dry in the center. So it's, this is not a punky piece of wood by any means. And this is a running about 12, maybe 13 inches long. The other one, and what? inch and a half in diameter, I guess. And the other one is a piece of white pine, a branch that I cut off dead, even has a little bit of fat wood around the outside. And, and of course, this is just a little extra bonus for people that may not be aware of it. But if you have a large branch on the base of a pine tree that is dead, if you take it off close to the trunk, good chance that you're gonna find a little bit of fat wood, especially around the outside. That's how the tree seals it off and allows it to remain on the tree dead. I cut this because again, I was looking for something of good 
quality wood, but it is a soft wood. I'm going to baton the two of these down and uh, then we're going to go from there. The task that I'm going to perform starting with is batoning. I'll baton these each into quarters. One of the things that I'm going to be doing, likely with this one only because it's a bit shorter, is to make a tent stake. Just a very rudimentary fundamental tent stake from a quarter of a round. And of course then a little bit of feather sticking. So just three basic skills. Batoning, uh, notching and feathering. So let's get started. I'll probably have to reposition the camera at some point. Again, this is the rock maple. I call it rock maple. It's also called, probably more commonly called, uh, sugar maple. Let me get up here. Sugar maple, rock maple, hard, hard wood. But this knife is not having any issue at all with splitting this out. Yeah, that still looks pretty good inside. Let me split this down two more times because I want to be able to choose which one I'm going to use for the next task. May not be the best piece because there is quite a wicked curl in it. And right down the pith, there is a little bit of softness, but not unexpected. I can get rid of that very quickly. Okay, now. That's the maple. I'm probably going to be out of vision here from splitting down the softwood, but let's see. I don't expect any problem with this. And it appears it might be a bit older and twisty. Can you see the twist and the knots in that? Holy smokes. Don't think I'll be doing any feathering with this piece of wood. Where'd the other piece go? Great firewood, but I don't think this is going to be great wood for doing any type of demonstrations on it. Let's see what else I can get out of this before we move on. One more attempt to split it. Yeah, it's just running out down because of the twist in the grain. It just wants to run out and little pin branches where they come through. That's not going to make good feather sticking wood. So I guess all of my tacks are going to be done using this wood, which is the rock maple. Okay, I'm going to reposition the camera just in a little bit so you can get a better look at what I'm doing. Okay, it appears I'm going to be moving the camera around a few times to give you the best look at what it is I'm doing. So I chose one of the quarters of that rock maple to turn into a tent peg. So one of the first steps, now you can do this in either way, is either to put a point on one end of it and a notch on the other end, or put the notch on first and the point on afterwards. I really don't think there's makes much of a difference. Now, when it comes to putting a point on, I could have chopped it with the knife. This knife would certainly do that because, and I think that's a good reasonable amount of chopping to do with a knife like this, but uh, we're going to save that chopping for maybe another task. But the other thing I like to do with a bushcraft knife is to hold it in reverse grip like this and use the chest lever cut to take a lot of material off the end of the stick. So let's see how it performs there without whacking my microphone up here, of course. So, yeah, okay, doing a good job with this. Did I say this was hard wood? Man, that's hard. I don't think it would make a difference what knife I was using on this wood. A little bit of a knot right on the end, of course. And done. All right. So there's my point. Certainly probably a little sharper than it needs to be. Let's just take that off. Yeah, that's a bit better, otherwise it'll just crush when I go to drive it into the ground. So there's the point of my tent peg, so that's another skill. Let's take it down and put a notch up in this end. So notching with a knife, regardless if it is this, the SRK from Cold Steel, or any other bushcraft knife, can be accomplished in one of two ways. You can use hand pressure to push down to cut into the wood, or you can do a slight batoning, and but what I mean by slight, let's see if I can get that well balanced, is just tap it in a little bit, 
to gain a bit of depth into the piece of wood. The goal is not to go all the way through. In fact, I think that's probably far enough for the demonstration. And we're using that as a stop cut so that as I cut down to it, that's what will create the L7 or the notch. And then you just cut down. And that's all. Now I can use the knife to clean it out like that. Now this is the simplest of all the notching techniques really, and a very, very basic skill. Certainly could have demonstrated a lot more advanced notching, but for the purpose of creating a tent stake, that's all that is required. Something to catch your guy line in when it's driven into the earth. Now, one thing that people often like to do with their tent stakes as they finish them up is to be able to keep them from splitting out, Is at least that's the uh, rationale, is just to chamfer off the edges. Because if you hit it with your ax, if you had an ax, or hit it with a baton, then just keeps the tent stake from being ruined or helps to keep it. I don't think it'll prevent it entirely. So all you're doing is just chamfering or taking the corners off a little bit. Now, the reason I'm showing that is, can I use this knife for finer carving? In other words, can I use it for this type of a task? Because when I'm using this task, I'm levering the knife off of my thumb like that. Is it functioning fine enough? Absolutely. Yep, doing the job just fine. Now there's a few more thoughts on this that I'll share with you in a minute, but that's another small task expected of a bushcraft knife. All right, now one more task to demonstrate and that will be, of course, can I create at least a reasonable fire stick with this knife or feather stick? All right, the last task we'll demonstrate with the SRK is doing some feather sticking, or at least we're going to attempt to. Uh, I have used this knife a fair amount. It will carve well enough. It will feather stick. Uh, not as good or as well as my bushcraft knives will. Now, having said that, with skill, you can accommodate your skill or with practice, you can accommodate your skill to whatever knife that is you're using. Bigger piece of the puzzle is the wood, whether or not you've got good wood, wood that is uh, not fresh enough because of course not green, but dry enough, but not so old that it's going to just flake off without staying on the stick and maybe not so hard that it's a lot of work to push through. So this being the rock maple, once again, sounds like a whining, I know, but with this being the rock maple, it can be a bit of a challenge. Let's see what I can accomplish. So I'm going to work. This is the outside and this is the inside. That's the inside of that quarter. And Okay, maybe I will work there. Normally you would work on the inside of the quarter, but it had a little bit of that pith, the, the heartwood, and I wasn't keen about using it, but I got rid of it easy enough. So that's the first thing, and this is not a demo on feather sticking or, or a skill practice session. It's more about what can you do with this knife. It's quite often your first few curls don't stay on, but you want to take your time to make sure your first curls do stay on because they kind of form the stop point for the fault curls to follow. So don't be in a rush. I know you can see some feather sticking done on YouTube and other places where people can whip them out in seconds and do amazing work. I'm always impressed. I'm not that good. There's no question about it. But if you take your time, create the curls, that's what it's all about is creating the curls. You can get better with practice. You can get faster. So is this doing the job? Part of what I'm doing now, of course, is I'm slicing. I'm riding, they're slicing, they're moving the edge of the knife down. That's where you get your curls. Now, just here's something I'll point out, and you probably already know this. If the curls are all going off in this direction, that's because I'm holding the knife at this angle. If I vary the knife so that the knife comes down at this angle, let's see if I can do one like that, the curl will go in the other direction. So I'm you know, it's good to practice both. I'll just tell you, it's a little bit more awkward to hold the knife, at least for me, to do that. But slicing into the wood at a consistent shallow angle is what will create your curls. The curls fall off of the stick. Just keep them. You know, just keep them. They're still fine tinder that'll catch a spark. All right, 
stop short of doing a whole lot of work for feathering, I think that's enough to show that this knife will create feather sticks. All right, so there is one more attribute or feature that we want on our bushcraft knives, and that is a nice, sharp, 90-degree spine on the back of the knife that we can use for scraping bark, wood, fat wood, and, of course, our ferrous cerium rods. And even though this co is coated, this SRK is coated, uh, it has that. It has a nice, sharp spine. Now, it's worn off a little bit, the coating has, and but that I didn't do anything to it. That's simply from using it. So let's do a little bit of scraping of this fat wood, see if we can get some fuzz. And it does that plenty fast, doesn't it? Look at that. Yeah, I would say that the spine is plenty sharp for scraping fat wood. Kind of pile that all together. All right, now, ferrocerium rod. Get that all packed together. Let's see what we can do. There we go. All right, that passed that test. Nice sharp spine for doing that job with. Okay, now we can wrap this video up. All right, uh, hopefully, even though they may not have been the most expert demonstration, hopefully you can see that the Cold Steel SRK will in fact do bushcraft tasks. Will it do those tasks as well as a purpose-built bushcraft knife? No, likely not. But then again, let's remember, this, this was designed to be a survival rescue knife, not a bushcraft knife. Now, let's go back to that for a second. As a survival rescue knife, there are a few things in this design that I think are things I would not like to have in a bushcraft knife. So let's just talk about those. First off, let's look at the blade shape and design itself. This is known as a clip point with an unsharpened swedge on it. The point of that, to excuse the pun, is to aid in penetration. That's why the knife comes to such a fine point. This is designed for penetrating. This could be a combat knife or at least a backup combat knife if necessary. It will penetrate very, very well. Uh, there is one of my first concerns, tip strength. Now, the original cold steel with a different design was slightly different in that it had a saber grind from here on down. This has a hollow grind, and it may not be a real deep hollow grind, a hollow grind meaning it curves inwards towards the edge. It may not be really deep, but I think you can see where the wear mark is. That, you would think, if this was a saber grind, the wear mark would be up that whole angle, but it's not. It's right at the transition between the angle and the rest of the back of the knife. The reason I mention that is because that hollow grind does extend right out to the end, of course. Now, let's take a close look, or as close as we can. Let's see what happens if I do this. Look how thin the tip on this knife is. Uh, I have not abused this knife. I have not seen how far I could take it with, be, without damaging it. But what I would not do with this knife, and I don't think this knife would stand up to, I may be proven wrong, is stabbing this into wood. Is that something you would do with a bushcraft knife? Not often, but occasionally I have used uh, for breaking up small splits of wood that I want to put in the fire. I'm talking about very small, something smaller as my finger, where I might hold the knife and just split the wood like this. Um, I would do that task with this knife, but I wouldn't do anything more aggressive than that for fear that the tip is going to break off. I certainly would not drive this into wood and pry it. I think I'd be disappointed and I would owe my friend Derek a new knife. So I did not want to take the testing to that extreme. But just looking at that, that is my concern. To be honest, I don't know if that's a good feature on a survival rescue knife. Combat knife? Okay, that's that's fine. But on a survival knife, something you expect to put through a lot of abuse, like whether it's being driven into wood or into steel, or, or not necessarily steel, but into metal. Uh, yeah, you want a, a tip that's going to stand out. I believe but I can't compare one against the other, that the original design of this knife would have been a lot stronger in that regard because it was a true saber grind and not a hollow grind here. Now let's just talk about the hollow grind for a second. 
Is that a desirable feature on this knife or any knife for that matter? Well, a hollow grind is done for a very specific reason. It really thins the metal out towards the edge, making it extremely slicey, very nice at cutting and slicing things. In fact, a lot of hunting knives are designed like that for that reason. And this knife is slicey, despite the fact that it's five millimeters thick. When I do any chores like that carving, that's where this hollow grind really starts to work. You know, I have a bit of a bias, and I don't mind saying I have a bit of a bias against hollow uh, grind knives, because I fear that the edge is not going to be strong enough to stand up to any real tough work, because that's not what they're intended for. Having said that, this knife has stood up. Now, again, I haven't really abused it, so I don't know how much uh, torture or abuse, which I'm not give, I don't give knives anyway, it would actually take, but I think the original design of this being a saber grind would have made for a stronger knife. Why Cold Steel chose to go to a hollow grind, I don't know. It could be where it's being manufactured offshore, that that's the production uh, way that, of doing things with them. Okay, let's, that is my thoughts on the blade itself. Now let's just move down to the handle, the Crayx or Crayton material, <coughs> excuse me, very grippy, very grippy, almost to a fault. At least when I first got it, I found, man, that's almost abusive to my hands. I think I could, I'll have to do all my work with a glove on. Well, I intentionally did these demonstrations without a glove because I think that's a truer test for me at least about how the grip works. So I left the gloves off. It works just fine. It's actually getting a little, I don't want to say smoother because there's still a lot of grip, but not quite so aggressive a feeling on it. Here's what I like and what I don't like about the grip. It is really tacky to the hands. I have a good functional grip on the knife. It is broad and that's uh, wider across than a lot of knives are uh, that come from the factory. So that helps out but it's blockish. Can you see how it transitions over the edge? That's, that hasn't been a huge thing, but I can feel it in my hand. So if I'm doing a lot of carving over time, that does start to give me, not bruises so much, but a bit of a tender point. And I mean, over time, it's not gonna happen. Certainly wouldn't happen with a pair of gloves on, but uh, yeah, it's not the perfect handle shape in my opinion. The other thing is it's almost as wide as it is tall through here. If this wasn't Crayx material, if this was a material like wood or micarta, that would tend to lead towards the ability for the knife to rotate in your hand. You want a knife that is taller this way than it is thick through. And uh, yeah, it's, that's the work of trying to find just the right knife for that reason. However, this is still functioning exactly the way it should for a knife in its design. It's very grippy. It has a finger guard here. You're not going to lose control of this knife in just about any situation that I can think of, including whether your hands are wet with water or anything else for that matter. It's going to stay in your hand, which is what you certainly do want of a combat or a survival rescue knife. Of a bushcraft knife, yeah, you don't want that as well, of course, because your bushcraft knife, you don't want it sliding out of your hand while you're using it. And, you know, you may be using your bushcraft knife, even though it's intended for it, for game processing or meal processing. So while they're not ideal for that, because usually they have a Scandinavian or a very uh, steep edge on them, they don't make great slicers. This will, this is a good slicey knife. So it can be pushed into a whole lot of use. I guess it crosses over from survival into bushcraft functionally enough. Still, it's a six inch blade. A lot of people would prefer their bushcraft knives, me included, to be shorter. Five and a half is as far as I would go. Five usually, four more often is the better uh, chore. But if I'm going to be using it for wood processing, there's an advantage to having a six inch blade. Okay, let's just talk about value and whether or not this is something you should purchase. So one of the best things about this knife is that Cold Steel stands behind it with a lifetime warranty. Can't beat that, right? They just, Cold Steel have been at this for a long time. They know how to make a knife and make it last and how to take care of their customers. The other thing is 
this is quite affordable. Now, here in Canada, this average is around $90. Sometimes you can get a little cheaper, uh, sometimes a little bit more. I noted when I, before I come out to do this video that this was per, you could purchase this on Amazon Canada for $90. And of course, with Prime, you're going to get, well, actually, you're going to get free shipping regardless if you have Prime or not. But I noticed a few other places where this could be purchased less expensively, like $75 or $78, but then you're going to be paying for shipping. So it probably comes out to about the same. What what that means is that this is a high value knife for someone whose budget is somewhat limited and still wants a knife that will do a lot of the tasks that they're looking for. So here's the question. If I wasn't loaned this knife by my friend Derek, would I have purchased it for myself? I like it. I just don't love it. And maybe that's the best way to describe it. There is a lot to like about it, but to me, one, and this is purely personal. It doesn't look like a bushcraft knife. It looks like a military knife, which is pretty much what it is. I don't have a need for a knife like that. And I find that the compromises this knife makes in the area of bushcraft, it's just not a knife I would have reached for. Now, I'm gonna suggest this. If you like this knife and your budget only allows for you to spend that $90 here in Canada, then buy it because it is well worth that amount of money. Having said that, there are knives that cost a little bit more, we'll say $100 to $110, which just put this knife to shame. And the one I'll mention, because I have started testing it and will be reviewing it, is the Tereva Jakari Puko 140. It's a five and a half inch blade, and it runs about $110 uh, and is made in Finland. And uh, Honestly, I'd choose that knife anytime over this knife. That's only my personal opinion. What I'm interested in hearing is what are your thoughts on this knife? Do you own it? Do you use it for bushcraft? Do you feel it fits all the chores or fits all the skills that you want to ask of your knife? Do you have any other thoughts on the Cold Steel SRK? Put them all, or any questions for that matter, of course, in the questions or the comments section below. All the information I have regarding specifications, where you can purchase this knife, will all be in the video description. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Get out and explore and take that path less traveled. It will make all the difference. Bye for now.